Let's talk about our sermon series. Our sermon today is the next sermon in the sermon series, Next. Because we're talking about next steps in our faith. And if you remember, two weeks ago, you made a commitment, many of you made a commitment to Christ for salvation for the first time, or you recommitted your salvation. And so the, the question is obviously, what's next? If this is a choice I've made in my life, if I am a new creation in Christ Jesus, which we talked last week about the fact you are, then what are the next steps in our process? Today we want to talk about becoming people of faith, all right? We want to talk about faith in our lives, and what does that mean? In fact, I'll give you the statement we're going to work with right up front. God is faithful, therefore I have faith. That's what we want to talk about today. That's what I want you to leave today, being able to say and understand and believe. God is faithful, therefore I have faith. That's what I want us to process. Say that with me. God is faithful, therefore I have faith. Now, let me tell you some things that I'm not talking about today that some of you already have in your mind. I am not talking about today a, a faith that is unreasonable. I am not talking about a faith that is unreasonable. When I was a teenager, uh, the, I was in a group and they had us do devotions, uh, particular devotions during that group time. And one of the books they gave us to do was a book called Don't Check Your Brains at the Door. And it was a great little book for me to go through as a teenager because what it basically said was having faith in God is not a matter of turning your brain off so you can have an irrational, unreasonable level of faith in God. Faith is not a lack of intelligence. Faith is not a lack of reasonable thought. Faith is not a lack of reasonable consideration of everything around you. I'm not talking about that kind of a faith today. Our faith in God can be reasonable and real, and our faith in God should be reasonable and real, and that's the journey I want to take you on today. We are not talking about a, a, an unintelligent faith. We are not talking about an uninformed faith. We are talking about a real faith in a real God who's going to give real solutions and real power to real problems in our real lives. That's what we're going to talk about today. All right. Secondly, let me tell you what else I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about a guru kind of faith. I'm not talking about that kind of faith that, you, you know, sometimes you think of faith and you think of some spiritual guru on the top of some mountain somewhere who always sits with his legs crossed like this, going, Om, and when he ohms just right, he levitates, you know. That's not the kind of faith we're talking about today. Because some people, when we say faith, that's kind of the image they get in their minds. They get this image of some guy who's so spiritual that he's just beyond anything we can imagine. He's just beyond anything. They get this Yoda look in their head. You know what I'm saying? Y'all remember Yoda from Star Wars? That's kind of the image we get sometimes when we think of faith. Somebody that's that. I'm not talking about a guru faith. Again, let me say this again. We're talking about a real faith in a real God who brings real power to real problems in our real lives. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about a faith that makes sense. And faith does make sense. Last thing I want you to know we're not talking about. I'm not talking about a faith that says, if I have enough faith, God will give me a Mercedes. All right? That's not faith. I know folks teach that as faith, and I know all of you have heard sermons on that as faith, but I want you to hear me. That is not faith. If, if, if your faith is all wrapped up in what God will give you and how much stuff you'll have if you have enough faith, that is not faith. That is spiritualized greed. And that's not what we're talking about today. That's not what we're going to deal with. So if you're expecting any of that sermons, any of those three sermons today, I'm just here to tell you, you are going to be disappointed by what you hear. Okay? What we're talking about is a real faith based in a real God that brings real power to real problems in my real life. That's what I want us to process today. All right? Now we're going to do this from Hebrews chapter 11 which is commonly known as the faith chapter. Now, Hebrews chapter 11 starts with this verse. Read this with me. Let's read it together. Um, now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. 
Now, some of you, upon reading this, will say, if faith is being sure of what I hope for and certain of what I do not see, then, Pastor, you are talking about a faith where your mind is disconnected, your brain is disconnected. And I would tell you, no, you're not. Because what the writer then does, and last night I read all the way through if, uh, this Hebrews chapter 11, with, and we all read it together. That made the sermon really, really long. So I'm not going to do that, but I do want you to go home and read Hebrews chapter 11 all the way through. Especially if you're one of our small group leaders and you're going to be teaching a sermon-based small group. I want you to read Hebrews chapter 11 all the way through three or four or five times before your small group gets together so you have this settled in your mind. Because what happens in Hebrews chapter 11 is that the writer tells us all about Moses and he goes, he goes through Abraham, he goes through Sarah, he goes through Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, he goes through Moses, he goes through all of these folks in the Old Testament. He basically works his way through a who's who list all the way through Genesis and then through Exodus. And what he does is he points out to the reader. He points out to us, listen, because Abraham had faith, God did this. Because, because Jacob had faith, God did this. Because Enoch had faith, God did this. Because Noah had faith, God did this. Because Moses had faith, God did this. Because they had faith, here's what, you know what he's showing us? He's showing us that God is always faithful. If you read Hebrews chapter 11, it is the faith chapter because it's a constant, repetitive answer to the question, can I trust God? The answer to the question, can I trust God, is always yes. Which is why our statement today is, God is faithful, therefore I have faith. Let me tell you the other thing we're not preaching about today. Because many of you have a Disneyized, worldized view of faith. And what you think I'm going to talk about here in a minute is, if I just have faith in myself... It'll all be okay. Pastor, you're going to teach us today to have faith in ourselves, aren't you? Because you have a Disneyized theology. You don't have a theology, you have a Mickeyology. All right? Now, listen, I am not here today to teach you to have faith in yourself. Let me tell you a secret about me, and then you figure out if it's applicable to you. By the way, it is. I am not my solution. I am my problem. And so if I teach you, have faith in yourself and you'll overcome anything, I'm setting you up for failure. Because that is not going to work for you. You're not your solution. You're your problem. You see, you see, my problem is not my mom and daddy. Everybody all right? My problem is not the people around me, my friends. My problem is not the world. My problem is not the social structure that has pressed me down because the man hates me. My problem is none of that. My problem is me. Does this sound familiar at all from a sermon we preached not too long ago? My problem is me because I'm all wrapped up in sin. And sin has so scarred and messed me up that I've become my own problem. And I don't need me to fix my problem. I need something bigger and better than me to fix my problem. And what is bigger and better than me is God. I need God. Hey, look, Abraham didn't need to believe in himself to fix his problem. He didn't say, well, I say unto myself, go take thou into the promised land. No, God said, go to a land I'll show you. And Abraham said, where is it? God said, I'll show you on the way. Just start walking. Don't you hate it when God does that? But he does that a lot. Moses didn't say, well, if I believe in me, I can, I can set my people free. No, Moses stood beside a bush and God said, hey, you, 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 go, you, go, you go tell the folks to, 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 to they're going to be set. <laughs> Pentecostals are freaking out again. Um, <laughs> you go tell the folks that I'm going to deliver them. And Moses says, not me. In fact, he starts to stutter because he can't talk his way through this. 
He says, not me, Lord, I'm not the one. Moses didn't believe in himself, he believed in God. Enoch was not counted as righteous because he had faith in himself, he believed in God. Noah didn't build a boat because he was the best meteorologist ever. He believed in God. The answer to our problem is not a faith in ourselves. The answer to our problem is a faith in God. Now, you say, well, Pastor, why should I believe in God? Why should I put my faith in God? I could choose many, many, many things to put my faith in. Why would I choose God? I'll give you two reasons. Number one, God created everything. Amen? Let me ask you a question. I've got to make sure we all believe, we all, we all agree on this. How many of you would say, by saying amen, how many of you would say, I believe God is the creator of everything? Amen. All right, all right, so we're there. So if he created everything, then he's, he's let's see, mm, really, really, really smart. Does that make sense? He's really, really, really powerful. Amen? Okay, so, so he can do, if he created the whole universe and everything in it, then he can do anything. Everybody okay with that? So our God, that means that God is sufficient. That means I can put my faith in him because he is sufficient. Let me, let me ask you, I got, I got to do another one. Um, by amen, how many of you believe that God sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for us? Okay, you know what that means? That means he loves us. See, it's one thing to have an all-powerful creator God. But it's a totally different thing to have an all-powerful creator God that loves us. Because if I have an all-powerful creator God, but he doesn't love me, that doesn't help me at all. But if there's an all-powerful, back, can I tell you something? If there's an all-powerful creator God, but he hates me, life really stinks. But we have an all-powerful creator God who loves us and is faithful to us. And because we have that kind of God, we can have faith that our lives will go forward in his strength and his power and we can trust him and he always comes through the Bible will tell you that. Hebrews 11 through these characters will tell you that. And I can tell you that. He never, ever, ever fails us. Therefore, we can have faith. Now, if we learn to have this kind of faith, it changes the way we live. Remember we talked last week about when I change the way I see myself, it'll change what I do. Well, now again, this week, if I, if I change the way my faith operates in God, it'll change the way I react. So let's unpack three things that I want you to understand about how we will live if we have faith. Number one, if we have faith, we will honestly acknowledge the impossible. We will acknowledge the impossible. We're not going to fake it. We're not going to run around and say, you know, oh, everything's just fine. We're not going to lie about the situation. We are going to honestly say what I am facing is impossible, and we're going to admit that. Look at this verse. Read this with me again. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Friends, listen to me. There are some things in our lives that simply are impossible for us to do anything with or about. There are some things in our lives that are beyond our control. There are some things in our lives we can't do anything about. Listen, I don't need faith or a God to handle anything that is within my realm of control. If I have the authority to control it, I don't need faith in anybody or anything else to take care of it. If I have the authority to control it, I'm in control of it. I'm good. I don't need faith. But you see, there are things in every person's life, no matter how, how, how smart you are, how talented you are, how rich you are, or how powerful you are, there's something in everyone's life that you don't have control over. That's what you need faith for. And in order to understand you need faith for that and to apply the faith you need to apply to that, you must admit that there are some things in your life that are impossible for you. And it's okay to admit that. That You say, well, that's just an admission of weakness. Well, that's okay. 
Because we are human, that means there's weakness in our lives. There's some things we're just not in charge of. There's some things we're just not in control of. And so a real faith in a real God that brings real power into a real problem, into my real life, is a faith that admits that some things are impossible. We are not, by our faith, ignoring the impossible in our lives. We are actually, by our faith, acknowledging the difficult and the impossible in our lives. Faith is not this pie in the sky thinking that says, oh, everything's fine and hunky dory. I get so tired of those Christians that run around all the time and life is always, wee. What? Come on, life is not always a carnival ride. Life is not always fun. Life is rarely easy. But if there's a God who has all power, and also loves me completely, then life is doable because I have faith in Him. Because He will remain faithful even in the impossible because everything that is impossible for me is simple for Him. Y'all following me in this? And all of a sudden life gets better and life gets more bearable and life gets more doable. Faith acknowledges the impossible. Well, when I have a real faith, that faith not only acknowledges the impossible, that faith, my faith, will activate action in my life. I will do something in my life because of it. Read this verse with me and then I want to explain it. Let's read this together. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Folks, Abraham, God called Abraham and said, go to a land that I will show you. And Abraham packed up his family and all of his stuff and he went. And he had no idea where he was going. And God showed him the way along the way. Can I just suggest to you that in your life, God's going to show you the way along the way God's not going to give you an itinerary he's not going to email you a detailed itinerary of where you're headed God instead is going to show you the way along the way and Abraham had no idea where he was going and even when he got there it's not like he showed up and all of the residents of the promised land went oh you're Abraham we've been waiting on you and they all bowed down and he was in charge that didn't happen Hebrews chapter 11 is very clear. Abraham never took ownership of the promised land God took him to. He lived his entire life and never owned even a piece of the promised land. But God had already said, I'm going to give this land to you and to your children. Well, wait a minute. When Abraham showed up, he didn't have children. I mean, look, he was struggling, man. He finally had a child with his wife's servant. Long story, look into it. Wow. Wow. It'll explain an awful lot of what's going on in the world today. Everything we're doing, all the wars we're fighting, have everything to do with Abraham's two women. The whole story is just wrapped up right there. Somebody came up to me last night and said, really? I said, Absolutely. And so anyway, anyway, I'm off, I'm off subject. And so Abraham, you know, Abraham didn't even have children. God, gave, in fact, when he when he was when he died, he had one son, through which his name would be carried on. And God had promised him a nation. Don't you think if God's promised to make a nation out of you, you'd have more than one? Okay, two boys. And yet, that's all he had. Abraham lived by faith. And God's promise to him absolutely played out as true. When Moses took off to the promised land, when Moses went to take the children out of Egypt, you know, you realize what his job description was? Take a couple of million slaves who don't know how to take care of themselves and turn them into a nation. And while you're doing that, by the way, do that on the road. Make them all portable. We need a portable nation. Folks, this would be like taking PG County and making it 
portable. That's the population range there. The, the population of PG County is kind of what he's working with. Can you imagine going to PG County and saying, everybody that lives in PG County, hey, all oh, y'all, grab a tent. Where are we going? Yonder. How are we going to get there? Long way. And building a nation on the way. That's not even possible. That's insane. And yet he established the nation of Israel. That's a faith in a God that will allow us to actually take steps forward that at the moment don't make any sense to us. Because if God's in it, he will always sustain us through it. Can I say that again? Let me say it a little differently. If God has called you to it, God will always sustain you through it. I need you to hear that. I need you to know that. That's why we can have faith in Him. That's why our faith can bring action into our lives because we know that if God has called us to it, He will see us through it. Every time. He is, that's our first word, faithful. Therefore, I have faith. My faith comes out of His faithfulness. And I can take the next step forward, even if it seems impossible. I, can, I, can, I don't have to be frozen by the impossible. I can be mobile in the impossible because I know God's got it in His hands. And I am not responsible for the outcome. I'm only responsible for taking the steps God told me to take. And then my faith plays out. If I actually have faith, then I will be able to acknowledge the impossible without being frozen by fear. And I will be able to activate action even when that action doesn't make sense at the moment. Third point. And I will be able to always, always, always anticipate better. God is taking us to a better place. God is going to make the world better through us. God is going to use our faith to change things around us. Read this verse with me. Let's read this together. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. They being Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Noah, Moses, all these people, their work, their faith is only made perfect in our understanding and relationship with the God of heaven. It's interesting. Think about this. Abraham, Abraham had no idea of a Messiah. Yet God would use him to establish a nation that would ultimately bring about Messiah. Abraham had no idea of the law, the Old Testament. When Moses is called by, the, by God through the burning bush to go and set the children of Israel free, there's no concept of, in his mind of the law, what we know as the Old Testament. It's not there yet. It hasn't happened. There's no concept in his mind at that point of Messiah, of Jesus, of God's Son coming back to, sa to save us. But God used him to do that. Not even knowing what God had ultimately planned, they simply moved forward in faith of a God who was faithful to them. And because of their faith, a nation was born. Because of their faith, a set of laws were put in place that told us something of who God is and what God expects out of us. Because of their faith, that nation established and flourished. Because of their faith, that nation sustained. Because of their faith, that nation ultimately produced offspring that brought to us the Messiah, Jesus, who is the Christ, who died on a cross for our sins. Because of their faith, he died and he rose again. Because of their faith, we now know the God they served and trusted, and we now find salvation in him. 
And their faith was realized and played out and made perfect in a sense that they could never have conceived of. But God always knew. In the end, friends, that's what I would argue as the biggest reason for faith. You have no idea what 10 years from now will hold for me. You have no idea what the next five years will hold for, hold for you. We have no idea what the next year will hold for you. Come on, we're Americans. We're in an election year. We have no idea what November holds for us. But God knows it all. Can I tell you something? I got to tell you a secret. This is why we can have faith. Lean forward. <clears throat> He's already been there. He's already been there, taken care of it, managed it, put it together, and prepared it for us. You say, well, I'm not sure I'm going to like the journey. I'm not sure you are either. I'm not sure I'm going to like the journey, but I know this. Whether I like the journey or not, God's got it in his hands. And in the end, he'll play it out the way it's supposed to be played out. Think about this. <clears throat> what if it's our job to be an Abraham for future generations? What if it's our job to be a Moses for future generations? What if it's our job to be a Joshua for future generations. What if that's what God, God has called us to? I close with this analogy. <clears throat> People will sometimes, pastors will sometimes sit down with me and they will say, Pastor Mike, why do you do what you do? Let me tell you what they're not asking me. People don't tend very often to sit down and ask me about church growth. The church here has grown a great deal, but there are other people who speak more eloquently about church growth. There are other gurus you really want to go to to talk to about church growth, so they don't often talk to me about that. They don't often talk to me about leadership. Leadership is a strength of mine in some ways because of the way God has, has designed me and then the positions he's put me in. But they don't talk to me about that because there's a lot of people that are better at that, and they're better at teaching that than I am. Almost to a person, they ask me this question. Why do you do that church planting thing you do? And how did you get to that place? It freaks them out. It absolutely freaks people out. When, I say, when, when we explain to them, you know, they will actually listen to me tell the story, and then they will go find somebody else and say, is that dude for real? He lying to me. The idea that we would bring in a Mo Diggs and we would say, take anybody you want to take and go start another church and let him take as many as he can take out the door freaks pastors out. Why? I, I often will look, I, I've had pastors of large churches look at me and say, Mike, I could never, I could never do that. And I, you know, I look at them and my, my response to that is almost always, well, why? Why? Because it kind of it kind of freaks me out. You see, you got to understand, I'm no great image of faith. I'm no, I'm no guru of faith. I'm no I'm no I'm no paragon of faith. I just I just I just do what God tells me to do. That's all. And so when I look at somebody and, I, and they say I could never do that, my question is why. And it kind of throws me. It kind of puts me in a tailspin because I know the answer. The answer is because they don't have enough faith in God to. Put enough people back in the pews after they sin. You say, well, how did that happen in your life? Well, let me tell you a story. When I took the job pastoring Sandy Ridge Wesleyan Church in Hickory, North Carolina, the first day I walked in the office, and you have to understand this about a young guy that's just come out of college. They, they take you and they dump you in a church and they say, Pastor. And you're like, okay, what does that mean? 
And all of your college studies and all, all, of, all of those studies did nothing to tell you what that means. And so you go there on your first Sunday and you preach and all these people are there on Sunday. You know, there's like, like 80 people there. It was our first church. 80 people showed up. I preached. And man, I preached everything I knew on the first Sunday. Because <laughs> I was only about 24 and that was all I knew, you know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to say next week, but blah, there's everything I got. You know, <laughs> and then Monday rolls around, and you walk into this office, and you know what happens on Monday? Can I tell you a secret about smaller churches on Monday? There's nobody there. You walk in this building, and you're all by yourself. And because the church is about 80 people, and there hadn't been a pastor there prior, you're, you're, it's the first time you're there, nobody knows you. The phone does not ring. And you're sitting there. I remember sitting there going, okay, God, what do I do now? You know, some of y'all are going, well, go pray and fast and study and sit cross-legged in the front of the room and levitate. <laughs> I found in that office an old uh, pictorial directory that I found interesting. It was of the North Carolina district of the Wesleyan Methodist Church, which means it was produced prior to 1968. And I started flipping through it, and I knew all these churches. And the Wesleyan Church, the family tree in the Wesleyan Church doesn't fork a whole lot, so I knew all the pastors too. And so, uh, and it was related to some of them. And so we, we start flipping, I start flipping through this thing, and I'm, I'm looking at it. And it had a picture of the church. And it had a list of every pastor that church had ever had for every church in that district. This is more than 100 churches, and I knew a lot of those churches, so I start flipping through it. <clears throat> Let me tell you what I learned. I started seeing this name over and over again, a name I did not know. The last name was Hawkins. And I know nothing to this day about this man named Hawkins other than this. There are about 10 of those 100 churches that he was the founding pastor of. And I began to sit, and I knew a lot of those churches. I was, I was pastoring one of them. And I began to sit and ask myself the question, what's up with Hawkins? Because I don't know his name. I've never read about him in a history book. And yet, my life, is now sustained by what he did. People are in heaven for the past hundred years because of what he did. And that really sunk deep into my mind. So that by the time I moved here, it was settled in my mind, in my heart, that we were going to plant churches. I walked into this church and about 70 some folks the first few weeks were here, less than that when I interviewed, and I said, there are two things that we are going to do. They said, what are they? I said, we are going to be the largest church in Southern Maryland, and we are going to plant churches. Now you talk about admitting the impossible. You talk about acknowledging the impossible. I was sitting in front of a group of people that had not been able to make a mortgage payment for a year, and the only reason they weren't foreclosed on is because Wesleyans borrow money from Wesleyans, and family don't foreclose on family in this case. The denomination held our notes, and the denomination said, we believe in you and we'll stand by you. The only reason the church was still open. My first phone call when I became pastor of this church was to the guy that was in charge of the bank that the Wesleyans run in order to fund all of our building programs. And I said, John, you're going to stand behind me and help me out here, right? He said, Mike, we are here for you. We are family. We got you. I said, all right, John, we'll do this. And to that group, we said we will be the largest church and we will plant churches. So why would you do that? Because in the end, one church can't reach a culture. In the end, one pastor can't reach an entire community. 
One personality can't speak to everyone in a county. One congregation can't minister to an entire region. But many congregations can become a movement. And they can see an actual change in culture. They can begin to truly influence the culture around them and truly change them. And in the end, it's not about a monument to us. In the end, it's about a monument to God. And so my vision is very simple. I look forward to a day in 100 years, if God doesn't come back, when somebody drives into Charles County, moves in here, and looks around and says, what is up with all the Wesleyans around here? Why are there so many of these churches? And by the way, why is God moving in such power in all of them? And let me tell you something. If God doesn't come back, that'll be important. Because somebody has to preach this gospel to our grandchildren. And somebody has to preach this gospel to our great-grandchildren and our great-great-grandchildren. And they will drive into this county and say, what's up with all these churches? And they will never know my name. And they will never know your name. But they will know the name of Jesus. And in the end, that's what matters. There are so many names of people like Reverend Hawkins that we don't know. But when we get to heaven, God will reveal to us, your faith is rooted here because his faith was rooted there, because her faith was rooted there, because her faith was rooted there, because his faith was rooted there. And he will take us all the way back to Abraham. That's what faith is all about. The ability to see so far beyond me that I will trust a God who has already been to the future that is so far out there I won't even be around for it. That's the faith I want you to deal with this week. A faith in a real God who brings real power to real problems in your real life. And if you find all that, you'll find a real faith. Father, I pray in this moment, in this place, that you would begin to do battle in our minds and in our hearts with all of those elements that would try to steal our faith from us. This world would try to convince us that our faith has no place in our lives. This world would try to convince us that our faith has no place in this culture. This world would try to convince us to let our faith go. But Father, I ask that you teach us otherwise. I ask, Lord, that you remind us constantly that you are real and we can have a real faith in you. That you are a real God and you have a real presence in our lives. Remind us, Lord, that our problems, they too are real. These issues are real. We can acknowledge that there is impossible in our lives because we have a God that stands far above the impossible. So let us acknowledge that. And then, Lord, put our feet into motion. Show us what to do and give us a real faith in a real God that will begin to make real steps toward real solutions. And then, Lord, show us that that God, that you will give us a future that is so much better and stronger than what we have seen. Teach us to anticipate a better future. And help us to think toward that future. Lord, this faith of ours has work to do in our lives. And that work will not always be easy. But use our faith, Lord, to refine us to bring us to a place that we are following you the way that we should. Yes, Lord, there are times that our faith exists in the fires. 
Yes, Lord, there's times that our faith is, it, it, it exists in a pressure that seems like more than we can bear. But in those moments, you are simply making us into an Abraham, into a Sarah, into a Hagar, into, Lord, a, a Joshua. You are making us into a, a, a giant of the faith through which you will change people's lives. They may never remember our names, but Lord, because we spoke of you, they will know your name. Give us a faith that stands through the fires and stands through the pressure. Refine us down into what you want us to be. And then God, gain glory through our lives. Let us be changed by you. And we'll give you the praise for everything you do. In your name we pray. Amen.